Uh, Claudio, what do you think of that, that basically debt servicing costs are going to be higher for EM? They're just not going to have the same kind of runway that developed markets can. No, absolutely. That's exactly the, the main race for the region. Uh, and I think in particular, Latam could be considered the, the weakest link within the region. It's, it's the region that will contract the most this year and, and the region that will recover the least uh, next year. Um, I think you can characterize the risks uh, both sides, risks to the upside and risks to the downside. Uh, risks to the upside would be that the, um, the U.S. recovers so fast that uh, relative to the rest of the world that we start having some inflationary pressures that put uh, pressure on interest rates and then obviously on the dynamics for, for LATAM. The risk of the downside is that we have um, a, another uh, second wave uh, in, in LATAM also uh, and also in developed markets uh, and obviously growth will suffer, global growth will suffer and, and uh, indirectly LATAM will suffer. The, um, the good news in that scenario is that at least interest rate will remain super low for, for longer uh, and, and probably um, the developed market central banks like the Fed in particular and the ECB uh, can do uh, a lot more still mm -hmm. uh, to support asset prices. But, uh, but I think those are the risks and, and definitely a risk that, uh, that I think the market is uh, under, underestimating a little bit. So let's break it down in terms of regions, because if you ask someone what, what they like in 2021, it would be very hard pressed to find someone who didn't like uh, emerging market Asia. Um, uh, is that the opportunity then for Latin America, or does it just mean that there's just too much risk in Latin America due to what we we're talking about in terms of interest rates rising? No, no, no. I think I think that's a, that's a great point, and and I think that's an opportunity for Latam because, with the exception of Mexico, Latam is a bunch of commodity exporters highly ex highly exposed to China and, and commodity prices, and uh, not only the global growth is is picking up, but also the composition of uh, global growth is good for Latam because China is driving uh, the recovery. So, so that is good for Latam, probably not as, as good for Mexico. Uh, we don't see a lot of recovery in growth activity next year in Mexico. And Mexico will contract 10% this year and will recover just 2% next year. But I think the rest of the countries will benefit a lot from commodity prices uh, mm -hmm. and China. Having said that, uh, as we discussed before, uh, debt dynamics is about growth versus interest rates. So. Uh, Latin America needs badly that global interest rates, in particular U.S. rates, remain relatively low for longer than until uh, growth uh, pickup is, is really strong in LATAM. And that's not going to happen necessarily in the first half because uh, the distribution of the vaccine is going to be probably a bit uh, sl uh, uh, slower than what uh, most of the governments in the region think at this point. So how do you play that? And I'm thinking if we make the relationship with commodities, right? I mean, copper has really outperformed. Most major banks think that copper will continue to outperform. They have supply issues as well as strong demand from China, particularly in a green energy shift. Um, how do you invest in that? Is that like a broad by Chile index? Is it the individual miners? Is it fixed income? Well, I think, I think the, the, the effects will capture a big chunk of that story mm -hmm. um, in general because uh, currencies um, weaken a lot lately in, 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 emerging, in the last few months in, in, in emerging markets despite some recovery. So in a scenario in which we have a, a global recovery driven by China, we should observe probably a weaker dollar and that should be good for, for EM. Obviously, in the case of, um, of, of Chile, mining companies will, will benefit in, in particular. Uh, interest rates, uh, probably in fixed income, there is not much to do because interest rates are already quite low mm -hmm. in, 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 in Chile, and there is not much room to, to go any, any lower. Uh, so I would say that it's probably effects and equities the, the main ways to, uh, to play the, uh, that view. What do you do with a country like Argentina? <laughs> Uh, Argentina is, uh, is a little bit difficult. Um, we have important midterm elections in Argentina. By the way, we have a lot of uh, midterm and presidential elections in the region as a whole. With the exception of Brazil, pretty much all the countries will have some kind of uh, an important election next year. Uh, in, in the case of Argentina in particular, I think uh, it's key that the government um, strike an agreement with the IMF as soon as possible. Uh, and, and start, obviously, um, um, tightening fiscal policy or putting the, the fiscal house in order um, uh, and, and start signaling uh, the, the rest of the world that they are serious about uh, uh, tackling the imbalances. Mm -hmm. uh, they are gradually stabilizing the effects market, but there's uh, a lot of, uh, still a, a lot of uh, homework to do. 
um, and, and and obviously the government is struggling between the, um, the um, talking to their constituencies and at the same time talking to the market. And obviously the messages or the optimal messages are not the same for the constituencies and the market. So that's basically the tug of war within the government. Mm -hmm. uh, but gradually they are moving towards uh, the right direction. I guess the other broader risk, and, and you sort of uh, picked up on it, is as we get vaccine distribution, if a, the vaccine does not get distributed as quickly as it does in developed markets, particularly in Latin America. Kind of what's the drag going to be on that? Well, I think the problem is that Latin America, uh, different from the first wave, uh, this time they're going to have a uh, much more limited room uh, of maneuver in terms of fiscal and monetary policy. Interest rates are already super low for LATAM mm -hmm. standards, uh, and, and fiscal policy is quite stretched. Take a look at Brazil, with the, the fiscal deficit will be like a 13% of GDP this year, and they are uh, badly uh, in need of, uh, of, of fiscal tightening and fiscal consolidation. So if there is a second wave, there could be more fiscal policy down the road that is going to be extremely limited. So obviously the impact on economic activity it's uh, it's going to be bigger. There are some countries that have some room, like uh, maybe Peru, Chile, um, but um, and maybe Mexico uh, that didn't do much uh, in the first place. But but the the other countries are are, are uh, very restricted in terms of uh, how they can react um, in terms of public policies. Uh, and obviously, there is a lot of uh, social fatigue for uh, implementing lockdowns. So mm. um, the the, the trade-offs are, are much worse. Uh, and then as we wrap it up here, I'm just curious to get your thoughts on the dollar. Um, does it have to go down materially more or if we just stay at a lower level and we're no longer in sort of a dollar up cycle? Is that going to be a catalyst? I, I think it depends on, on, on how the distribution of the vaccine plays out. Um, I, I, I think not only uh, in developed markets it matters, it also matters uh, what happened in, uh, in, in uh, emerging markets. Uh, if we had a scenario in which the vaccine is readily available within the next uh, three to six months, probably the, the, the trend for the dollar should be lower, um, despite the fact that probably we can have some inflationary pressures in the U.S. sooner than expected. But uh, it, there is a lot of uncertainty still about the, uh, the timing of the distribution of the vaccine in, in, um, in meaningful terms, mm -hmm. because unfortunately or fortunately, depending on the way you see it, uh, the um, immunization levels are pretty low, pretty much across the world. I mean, immunization yeah. levels are around 25%, uh, pretty pretty low relative to the threshold of 60%, 70% to get uh, uh, herd immunizations. Yeah. So uh, if there is a second wave uh, and the vaccine is not readily available, it could be nasty.